because you're jumping back into the gap. Outlet to coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Before we get started with this week's podcast, I wanted to let you know that access is now open to the Basketball Immersion Platinum Collective Mastermind. This is an exclusive private next level coaching development program for a very specific coach. Go to basketballimmersion.com slash platinum to learn more. Coach is really excited today to have Coach Jay Triano with us. In addition to being a great role model for myself and uh, many other Canadian coaches, uh, just a legendary career in Canadian basketball and very successful NBA coach as well, being the head coach of the Toronto Raptors and the Phoenix Suns and uh, currently an assistant coach with the Charlotte Hornets. And Coach Triano, thanks for taking the time to be able to share the game with us. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. It's great to be on. I know this is uh, something that keeps growing and I love listening to the podcast and love listening, so I'm excited to be part of it. Well, it's great. And when I told a few people you were going to be on, inevitably it came back to this. And you made so many contributions to basketball, but the one that maybe people will remember is it's not possible to goaltend on an inbounds play. Can you talk about how that came about a little bit? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. I had had that in my back pocket for probably six or seven years, and it came from rule changes. And, you know, the referees were saying, well, you can't possibly have a shot where you can catch it and shoot it with three tenths of a second. So I started thinking, well, how could you possibly score? And a little bit of it happened by accident. I was coaching the national team and we had big Sim Bular, who's like seven foot five. And we ran a baseline out of bounds play and threw the ball up to the rim and it went in. And he kind of he kind of goaltended and said, my bad. And I said, you know what? Maybe not. So then, sure enough, at the next year at the NBA meetings, the referees come in and I said, what would happen if I shot the ball from out of bounds and it went in the basket? And they said, well, obviously it wouldn't count. I said, what if it hit somebody's hand like up near the rim? And they said, well, it wouldn't be goaltending. So it would count. And I said, okay, there you go. And from that point on, I figured I got to put this in my back pocket. Now, the ironic thing is that when I took over as coach of the Phoenix Suns, I, and I had talked to coaches that I worked with. I remember Terry Stotts talking to him about this play. And he's like, yeah, well, how is that going to happen? And so on. One of the first weeks of practice after taking over in Phoenix, I told the players, uh, I said, you know, I always had this thing before practices where we get together and discuss a rule, a strategy, a play before we stretch and warm up. So I said, do you know that you can do this? What would happen on this? And they all said, goaltending, goaltending, goaltending. I said, no, it's not goaltending because a goaltend is only taking away a shot that would count. And sure enough, they were like, oh, okay. And I said, so if we ever get the ball out of bounds with three tenths of a second or less, I want someone to shoot it in. And Tyson Chandler, I want you to go up and I want you to like even just grab the rim and have it hit your knuckle and go in because it would count. Well, we're playing, you know, probably – a month and a half or so later and Memphis hits a shot to tie the game with us. And I think there's five tenths of a second to go. And I walked over to the timeout and all the players ran towards me and they said, try it, try it, try it. Let's try it right now. And sure enough, I said, okay, let's do it. Cause you know, to get a good catch and shoot with a half a second is tough, but we obviously uh, Bender took the ball out of bounds and I told him to throw the ball in the basket and Tyson find a way to get underneath the rim jump straight up and just goaltend it into the basket. And sure enough, he did that. And I think half the Memphis players were running around going goaltending. And I was running after the referee to make sure that they knew that it wasn't goaltending, which, <laughs> which they did. And they, they knew that. So it was a great way to, to win a game. And it was exciting. It's exciting when you sit on something for a long time. And, you know, the, the text that I got later from the coaches that I had worked with and shared this crazy idea with, to have it actually happen in the game, it was, it was pretty a lot of fun as a coach. That's so cool, and I've read a lot about that that story and that scenario, and I hadn't heard the part about the players alerting you or being aware, I should even say, which is yeah, yeah. probably even more the remarkable part that they remembered you talking about it, and that, that's yeah. such a cool part of it. Yeah, it, you know, it, it is because I think, you know, when I was on the national team playing for Jack Donahue, he took us to a, a, a practice. The Atlanta Hawks were practicing, and Mike Fratello was the coach at the time. And here I was, I went to this NBA practice for the first time ever. We were allowed to go in and watch, and 
the first thing that they did, he brought them all in and he taught them something that he had seen in another NBA game from the night before. And I can't remember what the play was. And I just thought, what a great learning experience. You get to these guys, you, you kind of get their mindset on the game. You teach them a little basketball IQ about a situation that might arise for your team later on. And I just thought that's something I always want to do. And to this day, on the road, I'll take my iPad and my phone and try to find a TV somewhere so I can I can watch three games. And I have this little black book, and I, I, I write down a diagram plays or situations that, uh, as a coach, I want to know and I want to have an answer for if that ever happens with us. And and I like to share that. I share it with coaches in meetings beforehand. I'll say, did you see what happened last night? What would we do in that situation? Uh, or when I was a head coach in Phoenix and, and in Toronto, I would talk to the coach. I'd say, okay, let's, let's talk about this. Let's debate. What would we do if we were in this situation that happened last night in maybe the Atlanta Memphis game uh, where, uh, you know, they needed a basket and, and, and there was only one second to go. And what play would we run at this time? I always put myself like being a fan of the game. You watch a lot of games and how can I put myself in that situation? And how are we going to teach our players that our coaches that, and you learn from watching so many games. Awesome. And this leads into, we were going to talk about special situations, but one of the obvious questions is how do you develop that awareness in your players? And you've, you've just talked about that. And, and, it, and you, especially nowadays, almost all the players would have seen a great play or a special situation, last second play from the night before, just inevitably on their social media. And I found that with my players, they would have seen what happened the night before in the NBA. So I could come into practice and talk about that. And they would almost all be aware of it. What a great tool. Yeah. And so would you generally do this before practice? You said before stretching, would you go through a scenario yeah. each practice? Sometimes, you know, you have a video, you could show a clip from the night before. I think it's sometimes fun to not always show video of your team. So maybe there's a situation from a game the night before and say, Hey, let's just pull up that clip and talk about what we would do in that situation. Maybe walk through it on the floor, or maybe if you don't want to spend time in the film room, you want to get right to practice. It's just something you talk about beforehand, but in order to, you know, I, you know, the, everybody steals everybody's stuff. So you want to look at late games and everybody's aware. After that play against Memphis where we wanted the buzzer, I saw it happen like five times in the next week. It was, you know, teams, teams pick up on it and they, and, and they try to do it. And it was like everybody would be sending me messages. Hey, they're trying your play. They're trying your play. It's like, and it, it, it just became, it, it became a fun thing. But I'll tell you, one of the things that, that you do, how do you teach your players to, the different situations is, is to try to play in those situations. When I was in Portland, Terry Stotts had this uh, idea, and I don't remember which coach brought it up, but it, it became something that we did on a continual basis. We played a game, and we called the drill 95-95. So we would have both teams, and they would play a game five on five, and you have you referee it and everything. And uh, obviously, if the, if the game is 95-95 and it's late in the game, you put both teams in the bonus, so you learn how to play without fouling. And as soon as one team hits 100, then you put the, the two minutes on the clock starts counting down. And so you have a two-minute game. So you could be, you know, you hit two three-pointers. It could be 101-95. So you're up six, and the other team has the ball. And we would play those games probably three or four times. And it, would be, it was a great way to scrimmage and get end-of-game situations. As a coach, you could coach both timeouts. Uh, you could, you know, you could look, look at the players and, and just let them play sometimes, uh, uh, have them play, have them say, no, time out. We want to advance it here or time out. Is, you know, we need to diagram a play, figure out what we're doing. Or, or as a coach, I would sometimes call a timeout and I'd say, I'll take the defense. Okay. They need a three. We are going to foul them when their back is to the basket. And we would teach offensively. I'd have one of the assistant coaches run the other team's play. This is what we're going to do. And I found by playing this game, we just call it 95, 95. And again, as soon as one team hits a hundred, the two minutes starts counting down and it just teaches you clock management. It teaches you end of game strategy, teaches you how to call timeouts and when to advance and when maybe you don't want to advance, how to get the ball in. If you know a team is trying to foul and just, it really presented a variety of things and you don't know which one is coming. For a coach, I like that because you need to be able to think on the fly. You need to be able to, to make adjustments late in the game. And I just found that that was one of the best ways to get your team to understand late game situations. Well, and as you said, for a coach, it gives you game like reps. And that's what drills don't do for you as a coach. And I share this with the coaches all the time. One of the values of playing a lot of five on five in practice is you get a chance to coach the game 
in practice. And that gets you better at coaching the game. And especially for assistant coaches, which I know you've been through different parts of your career, it's really hard to get game-like reps because you're just always offering advice instead of making the decision. So that's something that can shape your staff as well. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, as an assistant, you know, you get to coach the last two minutes of the game and you've got the non-starters. Man, that's become super competitive and you want those guys to win and you want to figure out how you're going to, how you're going to score with that team or how you're going to get a stop with that team. And, uh, you know, and those guys are always fired up to play in those situations because they might not be in that situation in a, in a game. So it's a great way to develop your staff. It's a great way to put pressure on yourself to make decisions late in the game. And I'll tell you, we had managers that have the timeouts last exactly long, as long as they do in the games where, you know, you got to make a decision quick. You got to diagram it quick. And I think that puts pressure on you as a coach and it helps you as a coach try to figure out how I'm going to react in the game under the same situations, just like we're trying to teach the players. Awesome stuff. So here's a question I've always thought about with so many possible special situations. How do you know which ones to practice and when to practice them within a season? I'm imagining that you can't get to all of them, especially in a short NBA training camp portion of the season. You can't get all to them then. So how do you prioritize and how do you decide which ones to practice and when? I think what we do is we create a list and uh, and we've got a long list at the beginning of the year, going into training camp down to 25 seconds, down four, 24 seconds, up one, 10 seconds. You know, you write down every scenario that you can think of and then you slowly chip away as the season goes on. And again, if you have seen something from a game the night before, it's a great way to introduce it to your team. I think that with shoot arounds and the required rest that a lot of teams have right now, non stressful days can be used to teach end of game situations where it's not going to be a lot of up and down. It's not going to be a lot of wear and tear in your body, but we're still going to accomplish something today. Your mind's got to be ready. You got to be locked in. Uh, physically, we're not allowed to do a whole lot. Let's take advantage as a coach to the rest management that a lot of teams are under right now and use those days as days where we can teach valuable game situations or things that are going to happen in in games. And and again, a lot of times it happens by playing, but there's times when you can't play. Let's do it at the beginning of practice. Before we get these guys going there, today we're just going to get shots. But before we get shots, let's go in the game. Let's get it in play where we know a team's going to try to foul us and uh, have our best five free throw shooters out there executing our end of game, get it in play. And then so that when you have to diagram it during a play or during a game, that you know where you're going to be. Sometimes you have to have these things where it's just a call. There's not going to be a chance. Call a timeout or the other team won't call a timeout. You got to get it in quick. You don't want to burn one of your timeouts maybe to advance the basketball. Uh, But I think before practice, shoot arounds, training camp, and slowly, you know, chip them off the list of all the different situations that you see or that you know are going to happen. Need two, need three. You know, all those things that are going to happen during the course of a year. And maybe the one question that comes to mind as you go through that and talk about a list and all that, and you've literally coached in thousands of games, what are some of the situations that come to mind that we neglect as coaches and we should spend more time on, in your opinion? Well, I think the one is how are you going to foul and are you going to foul? If, if it's a other team has the basketball and you're up three, are you going to put them on the free throw line? And a lot of coaches will debate. Now I'm going to make them take a tough shot. And worst case scenario is, you know, we don't want to give up off. It's a rebound on the free throw. I mean, there's, there's a, a variety of things that can happen. And it's a huge debate amongst a lot of coaches. I mean, I think even teams now within their staff, they're going, no, don't foul. Let's, let's play the right way. But I think – the one thing we talk about all that, but we don't teach, we don't teach how to foul. Um, so that now the guy gets the ball and the coach said I'm supposed to foul. And then he turns and he goes up to take a shot. And now he's shooting three free throws. So I think the, you know, the one thing is once we dis- describe the, our strategy as coaches, we need to get out there. You need to practice it. You need to figure out how you're going to, are you, how are you going to teach them to do that? How are we going to teach them to get a shot off in, in one second? I do a lot of guys know how long one second is to get a shot up. Can you, can you, can you pump fake? Can you put it on the ground one time? And just being aware by actually going through the things. Uh, I have 
so many things. Some, some are end of game. I, I, one of my favorites is uh, how to save the basketball. So many times the ball gets knocked out of bounds and you go to save it. And we know if we're in the, if we're, if we're in the offensive end that you don't want to throw it in and have it go to the, to the team going the other way. And now it's a five on four. Uh, this league is too good at that. So how do we save it? You carry the ball out of bounds. And, you know, one of my favorite things is just, just drop the ball to the nearest corner. So I'm going out of bounds and I can't cleanly save it. I don't want to throw it in blind. Just drop it to the nearest corner. And now you as my teammate see me chase a ball, you have a head start on the defense because you know I'm going to throw it to the nearest corner. Uh, you know, that's a situation that, you know, arises very few times. But a situation that I think, you know, you, you know, you, you know as a coach, it's a special situation. The ball's going out of bounds. We need, we need to know how to do that. We need to know whether we can throw the ball in the backcourt. We need to know, you know, with the, with, with, with the time and score. Uh, so one of the things I used to like to do is during shoot arounds, we always used to split up and have the veteran guys get shots up so that they, then they could go and do the media. Well, the young guys, I would sit them down and we would do like a crash course on, on rules of the game, uh, situations. Who were playing that night during a shoot around? Who's their starting five? Make sure that the bench guys, make sure that the young NBA players start to understand the league, start to understand the different rules, what's allowed. And, uh, you know, we had a list of rules and every, every, every game day we would, we would go through it. And I think as a team and as a program, all your players start to understand all the rules when you do that, because the guys that are getting shots now, when they were young players, they had gone through the same rules and the situations then. But I, I think, you know, in, in your repertoire as a coach, you need to have a strategy at the end, you know, a handful of plays because uh, close games notoriously come down to, you know, three different side out of the bounce plays that you're going to need. I'm going to need a two. I'm going to need, I'm going to need a three. Uh, how we're going to get it. I'm going to have to, you know, catch and shoot. I'm going to have time to work it. When do we want to take shots? I, I think another big thing in the NBA and a special situation is when do you shoot to maximize your possession? A lot of people think it's, you know, 33, 34 seconds on the clock. Uh, uh, the international game is obviously a little bit different. I think you got to go a little bit earlier because, the clock doesn't stop when the ball goes out of bounds. But if you can take a shot at 33 in an NBA game, you know you're going to get uh, a chance to play defense, but you're also going to get another offensive possession. So, I mean, I think the list is it goes on and on. But being a fan of the game and watching basketball, you can create that list. Awesome. Let's quick hit a few of those. I've been told by officials that I shouldn't yell out foul, foul, foul. That was way early in my career to my players when I want mm -hmm. them to foul. So what are some different terms yeah. that you've used to alert your players to foul? Well, one of my favorites, and, and honestly, uh, it hasn't been accepted a whole lot, but is uh, the stoplight. Red, okay. yellow, green. Red, yellow, green. The green means do not foul. All right. So, you know, you're, you're up five and it's their ball with 24 seconds to go. You don't want to stop the game. So we would be in a green defense. A red would mean foul. We want to foul. So we're in a red. We want to, I remember in Portland, I had, I had this bright red card that I'd, I'd, I'd hold up. I don't know if it ever worked, but I'd have this bright red card that I'd hold up. And that meant to, that was a signal to the guys on the floor. Like we want to foul because you're right. You don't want to say to the referee because a lot of teams right now, are not committing the foul, or, and they're just playing aggressive defense. To me, the key was for me was the yellow. And very, very rare when you would use it, but a yellow in the NBA would be two minutes and 23 seconds to go in the third quarter, and we've only committed two team fouls, which means in the next 23 seconds, I can be super aggressive, not going out there and whacking somebody, but going for steals, being physical with a body. And if they call a foul, it's okay. Now we have three team fouls and they still get the basketball on the side. It's not the first foul in the last two minutes. So now I have another opportunity before we get to that fourth foul where maybe I fouled within eight seconds and now there's 15 seconds on the clock. There's two minutes and 15 seconds in the quarter. I can be in yellow, which is super aggressive, maybe even trap. But if a guy gets out of a trap, then you're going to foul him. But you want to be super aggressive. So green, we're not going to foul. We do not want to foul. We're in a situation where we do not want the game to stop. Red, I want to stop the game. Yellow is going to be super aggressive and see how 
see if we can get a turnover or force a team into doing something. But I agree with the officials. You don't want to hear the foul call because we might not want to foul. We might just want to trap once and then foul. And, and then how do you, how do you, how do you come up with a, a, a single for that? You, you know, maybe you have your trap or you're in yellow, then, then you go in red. Uh, but uh, I think that, 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 that that's one of the key things is the old stoplight trick. I love that coach. And the five people that are going to listen to us for the next half hour, talk about fouling. It's going to be unbelievable for them, but I love this. And I can see the passion in your voice for this too. This is so good. And when you said yellow, my initial thought was scenarios that came up for me was, okay, we're trying to trap and get a turnover in the front court. But as soon as it's over half, it's a foul. Like maybe that type of thing for, for something. So I love that red, yellow, green. So I think that's really good. And especially green, because too often players assume we're fouling, right? And then right. that would alert them, hey, we're not fouling, we're not fouling, let's play. But what that struck me as thinking too is how important it is to alert officials that we're not fouling. Because too often they right. assume we're fouling too. Does that come into play at the NBA level too? Absolutely. And I, and I think there's a, a little bit of a communication thing that can happen too. We will say as coaches sometimes, listen, we're not trying to foul here. We're not trying to foul. We're going to, and they'll, the, the referees will look at us like, okay, I mean, I have to call it if I see one, but, you know, they'll, they'll understand our strategy. And, and the referees have been through as many of these situations as you have, but you do not want to give them the advantage of, or, or have them think uh, that they know what you're going to do because some teams now are thinking, ah, let's not stop the game. You know, it's a, it's a four-point game. Let's not stop the game and make it a six-point game. Let's go trap first or, or five-second violation. And, you know, we always talk that late in the game. Number one, let's get a five-second violation. Number two, let's get a steal if we can. Number three, we will trap it right away. And number four, uh, we've exhausted our one, two, and three. Let, now we're, now we're going to get into a foul or a red situation. It's really good stuff. Does this apply basically that there's one dribble or one movement per second of the clock? Is that how you've always communicated it to players in terms of the amount of time they have left to be able to make a move or decision? Yes. And I think, you know, the urgency of, you know, time and score and one one basket, you know, how much time do you want to leave yourself? And I think a lot of that comes down to personal preference as a coach. Do we need more than five seconds at the other end? I, I do have a timeout. I can advance it. And again, I, I think, you know, that's a personal preference with a coach. No, I'd rather have nine seconds so I can get it in and have a combination of plays where we might slip knowing that they're going to switch or we might set a screen on this guy and slip the second one. How much time do you want at the other end? But yeah, I think if we're in, in general, knowing time and score and that one dribble per second makes sense. And again, the more you can coach your players on this, uh, a guy bringing the ball to the floor with four seconds, if he dribbles the ball four times, I don't understand why we wouldn't run three, run another guy at him. You know, like one, two, three, four, the four seconds, there's not going to be time for a pass and a shot. So if he dribbles it with four, for four times and there's four seconds, there's probably not enough time to make a pass. Let's get over there and see if we can put up another defender to at least make a half-court shot or a long shot look that much more difficult. Do coaches get too conservative in late game defensive situations? I mean, especially at your level. I mean, the media is there and they have their traditional thoughts on what should happen, which isn't necessarily valid. But does that come into play that coaches sometimes get too conservative? Because what you just said made sense, you know, and even even sometimes trapping to get the ball out of a best player's hands. But uh, do we get too conservative sometimes? Hey, coach, a brief interruption from the podcast. Have you ever wanted to visit collegiate practices? Have you ever wanted to spend a weekend immersed in basketball development? Stimulate your coaching and spend a weekend with basketball immersion as we tour a number of collegiate practices. October 18th to 20th. Go to basketballimmersion.com slash practice tour to learn more. All practice visits will be followed by debrief sessions and discussions designed to augment learning. Go to basketballimmersion.com slash practice tour to learn more. Now back to our podcast. I think so. And uh, I think uh, of the NBA, especially because, you know, if, if you're playing a, a team and they have a star player, who's an all-star, I don't know many coaches and, and it's not probably not fair to all coaches, but I don't know many coaches that are going to want to 
have to go through the wrath of saying, you got the guy who's the MVP in the NBA and he didn't get a touch. So as a defensive team, why would you not make an average player make a tough shot to win a game and put two players on a Russell Westbrook or James Hart and make those guys not be the hero. Because I think so many times the great players are the ones that make the shots down the stretch. And I think defensively we're conservative. Well, why would I leave this guy wide open on the wing? Well, because that guy wide open on the wing analytically might not be as good as this star guy one-on-one in an ISO situation. But you run two guys at him, make him give it up, because a lot of these guys are not going to want to give it up at the same time. So I think, again, it's understanding who you're dealing with and the type of players that you're dealing with. But I would think that defensively, we're going to see more and more in the NBA that teams will become less conservative and gamble with how they're going to defend more. I think we saw it with the Raptors in the, in the, in the playoffs, playing a little more box and one. And I think we'll see more teams in the NBA play zone defense and just try to take teams out of the rhythm. You're a big believer in using analytics to develop your system on offense and defense. I, I, I got a little bit of time to spend with you when you're with Phoenix and, and saw that, but have you used analytics to help you form strategy with special situations? I, I assume so. And if so, how? Yeah. Well, I think the two for one, is, yeah. is a is a big one. I mean, uh, you know, breaking it down and how much time you're going to have to go the other way and what type of shot that you want to get. I think fouling to get the last shot. I mean, this is this is way out there, but I think watching the World Championships years ago, Argentina was playing against Spain in the gold medal game, and it was a tie game with less than 24 seconds to go, and Argentina elected to foul and put Spain on the line for free baskets with 24 seconds to go in a tie game. And I don't know if I've ever seen that anywhere else. But Calderon went to the free throw line. He made one of two, and Argentina was where they wanted to be. They wanted to determine their fate. They wanted to play for the last shot, and they wanted the fate of that game to be in their hands offensively. Uh, Ended up losing. But I keep saying to myself, had they won that game, and I think it was Nocioni who missed the shot, had he made that shot, how many of us in North America would have adapted that where we want the ball last offensively? And again, I think that that is something that you can look at analytically. We've talked to our analytics guys, you know, and some of the guys that I've talked to in the analytics, and this is where it's way out there. They think in a, in a, in a 10 point game, that the fouling should start with five minutes to go in the game and slow the game down and so on. And, you know, I think that that's where we get, we kind of go, okay, we're not there yet, but analytics is slowly taking over more and more. And I think that some of these guys coming up with these different things are going to change how we, how we play the last few minutes of the game, but who to foul? Does it make sense to foul a guy who is a 60% free throw shooter? if he gets you in a tough spot, does it make sense to do it to him anyway? The difference between a 60% free throw shooter is like it's 0.5, you know, 0.56 six points per possession. 75 is 0.83 like per shot. So it might make sense to foul some guys like that. So when do you do it? Do you do it early? And the analytics guys are these guys that are breaking all this down and figuring out, Hell, I want to, we want to do it earlier. And as, as coaches, it, it's tough to wrap around your head around some of these analytics all the time and, and buy into it when you're a traditionalist who has played the game a certain way for a long time. But I think that's what's exciting about the NBA game right now. It's changed. Teams are not taking mid-range twos. Teams are getting to the rim. They're trying to get fouled. They're trying to shoot threes. And I think that, you know, end-of-game situations are not a whole lot different. It's amazing to think what's possible in the future. And I guess the other question that came up while you were saying that is, are the analytics different in the regular season and the playoffs? Do they change significantly, Coach? Do we know that for sure at this point? Well, I, I think they do, but I think it's based on the defense more than anything. I think that, you know, we see more mid-range shots because, you know, in the NBA and the playoffs are so well defined and scouted and you've played the same team over and over so they know what you're looking for they know to protect the rim they know to to take away the three it's the regular season games where we're seeing 53s taken we're not seeing that a whole lot in the in the game but it comes down to 
when do we take the mid-range two? When do we take what arguably some people say is the worst shot in the game? Well, you got to take it when it's late in the shot clock. And I think we see that more often in the playoffs because the defense is that much better. They're locked in. They're geared in on every play. There's not a breakdown early. So you got to create something at the end. And it's the mid-range guys down the stretch that sometimes have to make the great plays. I had a analytics discussion with someone in an analytics department and they suggested that the analytics say that NBA teams should be offensive rebounding at a much higher rate mm-hmm. than they are, for example. But again, that mm-hmm. goes against counter to what traditionally has been happening. Is, is that another area that's going to change over time is that teams are going to crash the offensive boards more again? I think so. I, I think that's the, that's the one, I think everybody thought, okay, well, our, our defensive rating is, is, is this, but we could eliminate three shots at the rim if we had five guys back on the, on the raise of the shot. Or we could eliminate two more shots at the rim. Uh, wide open layups are, are, are two points per possession. That's a tough one. That's a, that's a tough one. So let's get guys back. Let's make them play in the half court. And I think you're going to see a wide range of concepts based on the coach's philosophy of we're going to be a great defensive team. We're going to be back all the time. We're not going to give up any of those easy ones or offensively. We're going to put this team at a disadvantage because we're going to go and we're going to get second chances. And, you know, I think that, and that goes another one again, where with the rule change in 14 seconds, we'll t- we can talk about that later because you've got to create a whole new strategy for that as well. But I just think that, it's based on I, – I think we're going to see more teams attack the glass. I think as good as the athletes are in this game right now, you're going to ask them to not only attack the glass but still get, be able to get back in defense. You know, you might have to communicate, might not have the matchup you want, but that's probably only the difference of point zero two points per possession is having a bad matchup, which you might be able to correct at the defensive end, whereas you can't correct getting another offensive possession. And let's just say you're an average team, you get an offensive rebound. That's one point per possession. So one point per possession, that's a lot of fast break that you have to give up to give up that one point per possession. If you're at, you know, 0.12 or 0.02 or 0.5, whatever it is you give up just because of a mismatch. Totally, totally on board with that. And then, and I'm not as good at math as you are, but when I look back at my notes about what he said, he said for every 1% improvement in offensive rebounding percentage, it came up to 0.1076. And then I think uh, transition rate of misses was 0.1188. And then if you look at the teams that, you know, offensive rebounded the most or the least, it came out to a variation of like 0.7 wins or 1.2 wins. And it was just fascinating yeah. to hear that because, again, you don't hear this from a lot of NBA coaches. But again, over time, these analytics are going to change some of your thought process because, you can't fight the math. The math, the math says yeah, what it I, says. And it's great. And there's sample size in the NBA with the number of possessions and the length of the season. Uh, it really gives these guys a, a ton of information that we seriously have to look at all the time. Uh, that's my, my belief on it. And now when they're going back and they're looking at games that were played years and years ago and taking the analytics from those games, and that's why our game has evolved so much. And I think as coaches – we have to keep evolving with the analytics. We have to keep evolving with the game. When these guys come up with all these ideas, you have to weigh that. It's you as a coach, how can I implement this? Do I buy in 100%? Am I going to buy in a little bit with it? And I think that, that you know, that's how we grow as coaches as well. Keep expanding our, our base knowledge. Well, it's just fun to talk about regardless, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Just fun for these discussions and everything else. So. Coach, another thing I wanted to ask you about, because you've been involved in a lot of NBA staffs and a lot of different roles and stuff like that. What are some of the best strategies for managing a staff that you've experienced? Because, I mean, clearly at the NBA level, staff sizes are getting bigger, but I think this is a challenge. Mm-hmm. And it's something I get asked a lot is about how to best utilize assistant coaches, how to best to utilize support staff and different things that happen. So what are some of the best strategies that you've seen in your time? Well, I think the key for me is that when I was an assistant coach and just starting, if you gave me, let's just say, solely baseline out of bounds plays, that was the one thing I was doing as a young coach. I'm energized. I'm keen. I might have been a fourth guy behind the bench, but if I, I was cheering like heck 
for that ball to go out of bounds on the baseline so that I could have my say. And I would make sure that I got my one little bit of practice in. And I just think how much you involve your coaches is how much you're going to get out of them. Now, I think it can still be all you as a head coach, your ideas, your thoughts, your philosophy, but teach the young coaches how to do that. Give them ownership in it. And I think when I've worked with coaches that have given me ownership, it's helped me as a coach, but it's helped morale. I'm fired up about, you know, all situations. You're cheering for the other coaches because uh, my, the buddy beside me, who's also in the back row, he's got side out of bounds when there's less than 10 seconds. And he's got his four plays there. And he's relayed those to the coach, but those are his specialties. He's going to break down film on that. And it's a great way to introduce young coaches to what they're going to get a chance to do as they grow as coaches. So it might be something small, a baseline out or a side out with less than 10 to go. Uh, but those are things that are going to help them where they get to watch video, break it down, analyze the situation. And boy, I'll tell you, for me, it was like, that was the best thing ever. I just wanted the ball to go out of bounds on the baseline more than, more than anything else in that game. So that, I, I, you know, you could have your say or you could be part of it. But uh, for me, involvement with all the coaches, uh, get them involved, give them a piece of practice. Uh, I, I really think that the NBA is such a long, long season I don't think that you can hear one voice 82 times plus the shoot around plus the practices. And I, I just think that the, the, the players right now, their focus will wane if they, it's one voice that they hear all the time, mix it up, change it up, give give different coaches, different responsibilities. Let one coach take a video, let the players take video, but more than anything involvement. I think dividing up scouts is a big thing. As long as you have, the capability of and trust that guys will do a great job for you because as a head coach, you're always going to do the scouts. You're going to, you're going to know it. But when you give I remember early in the NBA and this actually affected me as, as a, when I became a head coach, I remember I had a scout and I believe it was Chicago in two days and I was studying them for a whole week. And I remember we got, uh, to the game the night before and I was rebounding for one of the players before the game and I had to look at the logo on the floor to even know where I was because I was so locked in in Chicago tomorrow night that it was just a, it completely, uh, you know, and, and, I, and when I became a head coach, I, I didn't know if that was fair. I didn't know if that one of my coaches thinking about one team was, was fair to everybody. So uh, I brought a guy by the name of Micah Norai in, and he did every scout because I wanted our guys focusing on our players. We were in Toronto and we were talking about developing our young core. I didn't need to spend, have one of my assistants spending three days or four days on Cleveland or, or three or four days on Chicago. I wanted them to spend every day on our guys because our whole focus at the time was about making our young players better. So I changed that a little bit, but I think, you know, giving guys responsibilities. I, I love the way that we do it in Charlotte. We all have different players that we watch individual video with. So I'll have two or three guys there and different coaches will have two or three or four guys. If they have uh, scouts, we have an offensive scout. Uh, we have a defensive scout. We divide those up, and I think it just keeps everybody involved. Therefore, everybody's all in together, and I think that's what builds a real strong staff. No, I, I love that idea. I mean, just to just to be able to think about your team a little bit more in terms of that, and that's really good. Some de- maybe some uh, defensive special situations, Coach. What are some favorite things to do defensively that maybe we haven't thought about, say, on – let's say on side out of bound? What are some things that uh, have worked for you? Well, I think, you know, how are you going to throw the team off balance? Uh, I mean, you know, Brad Stevens has done a real good job lately of playing a little bit of a diamond defense in the half court. You know, we talk about offensively having your play where you need a two, you need a three, but now do we have a play against the zone? And how are we going to get that play against the zone? So it creates your team having to go through another situation in walkthrough. But I just think, like, I've seen where teams have played zone, number one. Teams have trapped the ball to take it out of the first player's hand or a star player's hand. If, it, if this guy gets it, we're going to trap him and give it up, and then we're going to scramble back and, and play. We are going to switch everything starting now with the ball out of bounds, so even off the ball. 
we are going to switch only on the ball after the ball gets in bounds. And again, so much of this is based on your personnel, but throwing teams off and trying to figure out, you know, I think the big thing for us is scouting reports. I mean, we know end of game situations, uh, you know, teams will, you know, they call the timeouts so that they can hide it. They can bring in something that maybe they haven't done Well, defensively. I think you've diagrammed the play. You've called the timeout. It's your last timeout. You go out there and you see they're in a two, three zone. Now, what are we going to do? And I think this is where, you know, trying to throw a team off at the defensive end, you can do that. Uh, fouls to give. How are we going to foul? When do you want to foul at the end of a quarter? Inside six seconds, make them take it out of bounds, I think is a good thing. I, I, I think with space and the ball live, let's, let's reach for the ball. You'd be in a, in a, in a, in a yellow almost where you're, you're, you're aggressive defense. And then with six seconds, you want to foul. Make them take the ball out of bounds and see what they're going to do after having to inbound the basketball. Maybe you, maybe you, you put two guys on the start and don't let him get a catch on that. Make somebody else have to make a play. Make teams reset their offense. Yeah. Don't commit intentional fouls. You know, there's, 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 I think just keeping, keeping teams off balance is probably the key. Great. So many things to think about. And maybe have you, and is it okay to diagram a play for your team that they haven't practiced in practice? I think so. I think you learn a lot about your team and players as to whether they can translate a diagram on a whiteboard in a timeout and go out there and, and execute the same thing. I remember in Portland, uh, Robin Lopez had to see it a certain way, so he'd always spin around and sit right beside Terry Stott so that he could, he could see it from the angle that we were going to be running it at. And, and, it, and if that worked for him, that was great. But I think that what happens during games is that you can't predict what's going to happen. So a lot of times coaches will say, I need to have a player where I'm going to slip this guy but I'd rather have it only happen on a single side tag. So how am I going to do that? And boy, I'll I'll tell you what, if you've practiced all that stuff beforehand, you know, kudos to you because there's probably a a 101 different situations that you could have late in the game. But I think, you know, I found that the best success though, coach is that when you tweak something that you've already done, so they see something that looks familiar to them, but then you say, but instead of doing it like we always do or that we talked about, instead of coming up and set that screen, I want you to take one step up and then I want you to slip to the basket because we're going to catch them on a switch and you'll be able to have a, a lane to the basket. So I don't mind diagramming plays that they haven't practiced, but I think the more you can keep it similar to something or a set that you're familiar with, the easier and the faster you can get into it in your timeout where they understand it. It's great. Yeah. Add a little tweak to it and, uh, and go from there. And uh, I'm always curious by that because I've certainly heard coaches say that they would never do that. And I've certainly always been someone that believes that, especially if you coach your players the right way within practice, that they can handle little adjustments like that. Or, you know, sometimes you see something in a game that uh, you're suddenly alerted to that, as you said, you've watched so many games that you're alerted to a situation, your players can handle it. So it's, it's always interesting to hear someone's perspective. So. Coach, maybe another thing that I, I've heard this, and just knowing you a little bit, I can totally believe this, but uh, just your ability to connect with players has always been referred to as, as tremendous. What are some ways that you connect with players, especially when we're talking about these modern players, and build trust with them? What are some things that uh, you think coaches can do more of to be able to connect with players? I think you, I think you change with the times. I mean, social media is such a big thing and part of their lives right now. It, no matter what we say, no matter, you know, your phone can't be on here, or your phone can't be off here, as soon as they're allowed, they're going to have their phone on. And being involved in social media, for me, I think has helped me as a coach. I, as simple things. You know, if I follow the players and I see that, uh, you know, Damian Lillard was – at his sister's birthday party last night and so on. What a great way to connect the next day as a human being. Hey, Dan, how was your sister's birthday last night? You know, he, I, I wasn't there or anything, but it shows him that you're interested in them. It shows that they're interested. They have interest outside that. They, I don't, my favorite story in, in Portland was with Damien. He had this thing called Four Bar Friday, and this is before he became the rapper that he is, but 
he would challenge people to do four bars. I had no idea what four bars meant. I was, <laughs> I said in a coach's meeting one time, I said, I didn't know that Damien drank and that he went to four bars every Friday. <laughs> and they were, the coaches, the coaches looked at me like, dude, it's a rap. And so I created my own rap for him and uh, I showed it to him the next day. I said, man, I didn't know. And I, I created this rap and, and played it for him. And it was all about me not understanding what four bars meant. And uh, he got a kick out of that. But I just think that number one, treat them as human beings, uh, be compassionate about them and their lives outside of basketball because they're humans first care about what they are, who they are, what they're going through. We think we have all these pressure and the stress as coaches. Oh, these guys are playing and trying to compete for the next contract. I think as assistant coaches, you have a better chance of having a great relationship with players. A lot of head coaches have it, but it, it, it's tough to have sometimes that great relationship when you're not playing a guy. But as an assistant coach, you can sympathize with guys, you can work with guys. And I think the key thing to remember is that they and we are only in this business because of how competitive we are. We want to win games. We want to be successful because if we're successful, that means that we could get to, we get to continue doing what we're doing. And, uh, you know, how can I help this guy become successful? Well, relate to him, number one. Number two, find a way to help him and be as competitive as possible, whether it's him uh, guarding a guy and an idea or whether it's staying with him in the gym to work on shots. And I think that's how you build relationships with these, you know, with, with these players is just care about them as people first and, and then knowing what they're going through as basketball players. And I'll tell you what, that helps you build a lot of relationships and lifelong relationships with these guys. Well, what a great point about using social media to your advantage and definitely that's the case nowadays is that you can get real insights into their life and, and different things, as you said, to connect with them with. And w- what a great point. And that's just awesome. And coach, I mean, there's so many special situations we can talk about. We don't have time to get into them all, but I really want to make sure that people know that you wrote a book, open look yeah, yeah. Canadian basketball yep. and me. And, uh, I can, uh, I, I can imagine, uh, my brother has a copy of this. He's an author and he said it was outstanding and I look forward to reading it too. But uh, can you talk a little bit about the process of going, writing a book? Yeah. yeah. To be honest, it was something that I didn't even think of doing. It wasn't my idea. I think with the growth of basketball in Canada, Simon & Schuster approached me and they said, uh, you know, basketball in this country is going to take off. We've got more and more players playing in the NBA than we've ever had before. The young players are better. It's just going to keep growing. We don't know a whole lot about the history. You're a guy that has played in three Olympics and, you, and you've coached in one. We want to just talk to you about how you got there, what basketball was like playing for Jack Donahue in the 80s and what it was all about. So we sat down and I said, sure, I'd like to do that. So I sat down with Mike Grange and we basically went through all, all the years with the national team and my career uh, playing for Jack Donahue for 12 years and then my career with as coach of the national team on two different, two different occasions. And it just turned into... Uh, something that they felt that they needed to do so that they, we, we would have as Canada, as basketball in our country grows, what it's going to be like in the future uh, or, or, or how can we look back and see what it was like and where we are now in the future. So it was a lot of fun reminiscing. It was a lot of fun uh, recanting stories and trials and tribulations of both player and coach. And uh, it was just, uh, it was a lot of fun putting it all together. Uh, I honestly, I don't think I've read it since it's been, <laughs> since it's been, uh, <laughs> But since it's been printed, but Mike Range and I sure had a great time, you know, sharing stories and talking about the history of, of basketball in Canada and, and dreaming about the future of where, where it can possibly go now. Well, and, and Mike Range, for those that don't know, is a tremendous, tremendous supporter of, of all sport, but especially basketball in this country and a great writer and follow him on Twitter as well if you don't. But coach, I mean, open look, Canadian basketball and me, I hope so many coaches go and check it out and such a great insight into basketball in general, but uh, certainly Canadian basketball as a whole. And uh, I know you've helped touch almost every generation of basketball coach and basketball player, you know, over the last 30, should we go back that far? 30, 40 years, coach. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, crazy. Yeah. you know, on, on be- being Canadian, I, I thank you for all your contributions and your ongoing support of Canadian coaches and players and uh, just amazing. So, Coach, thanks for taking the time and uh, sharing with us. And we look forward to circling back with you at some point. I look forward to it too, Coach. And thank you very much for having me on. I've, I really enjoyed this. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. 
I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations. So connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.